Hey, business besties, welcome back to the Female Founder World podcast. I'm Jasmine. I'm the host of the show and the creator of the Female Founder World universe. Today, I am talking with my very worn out voice from Summit. It is wild. I was speaking for about 14 hours straight and rolling straight into podcasts, but we've got to do it because I'm so excited to talk to you. We've got Laura Henshaw, the co-founder and CEO of Kick. You are now entering Female Founder World with your host, Jasmine Grinesworthy. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And I was so lucky to be at the summit and it was just you killed it. incredible. Oh, thank what you, you have yeah. built here is amazing. Thank you. Right back at you. For people who don't know Kick, what have you created? So Kick is a health and wellness app and lifestyle brand. We launched in back in 2015, so it's been quite a journey. And we're on a mission to help people change the relationship that they have with wellness, but then most importantly, with themselves. I love this. And you started it with your co-founder, Steph? I did. Co-founder and best friend, actually, at the time and still. We're still best yeah. friends now, which is amazing. So funny, so many people say, don't go into business with family or friends, but for us, it's been the mm. most magical journey. So it started back. So as I said, we launched in 2015 mm. with an ebook, but our story started before that with our kind of our friendship, but then also the experiences that we both went through that kind of was a catalyst really for why we started Kick. We both went through our own personal journeys, basically with disordered eating and struggling with body image. Sadly, I think it's something that maybe many people, many women listening will have felt in their life at, mm. at some stage. Unfortunately, there's not many of us that haven't gone through struggles with with body image because of the pressure that the media in particular puts on women to be smaller, take up less space and to continue to lose the last five kilos, which yeah. is just the messaging oh, we hear God. over and over again. And, and you'll lose that five kilos and then you'll think there's another five kilos. Trust that, me. That's exactly. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened yeah. to me. So I was actually doing my law and business degree at the time and I got an opportunity to go and model in Milan. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I was modeling on the side. It paid way better than what I didn't model. I didn't get a lot of work with, especially within Australia. It's a really small market. So I probably work like once a month, but yeah. it was so great to have on the side of uni. And when I got this opportunity, I was like, wow, like how cool to go and model overseas. Amazing. And I, I deferred university and I am a really disciplined, like type A personality mm -hmm. person. And so when you mix that with trying to lose weight, it's, and you don't only have to be type A to go or really disciplined to unfortunately develop disordered eating or an eating disorder. But for me, it was the perfect recipe for yeah, really going downhill there with my relationship with food and, and exercise and it's both between social media and the pressure that put that puts on us and the people that I was following, like all of a sudden, I remember when I first downloaded Instagram and this is going to make me feel really old, but the reason when I first got it was because I wanted to put filters on it, photos like sepia. Yep. which I know yeah, now, I tragic, like who is using that now? And I'd put a filter on a photo and then I'd screenshot that, cut it out and put it on Facebook. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I was doing. And But then what I just got opened up to was this world of all of these women and these people that looked perfect and mm. they were sharing what they were eating and how they looked that it way. It was a weird time on the internet. Oh, it was. And it was really like that Kate Moss era. Of, yeah. I remember there was this quote that went on a T-shirt that was Kate Moss. It was like nothing tastes as good as skinny feels, which is, and I'm sorry, I put a, should have put a trigger warning before mm. that. It's, it's, can I swear on this? Mm. Oh, great. It's, <laughs> it is, it's so fucked. Like seriously, mm. that was the messaging that we were being fed. And so I got really caught up with that. And then alongside being in Milan modeling where it's very different to Australia. Australia still has a very long way to go, but the industry there, like you have to be so small, like a size four to even get any work at all. And I remember when I got over there, I had deprived myself so much. I was the smallest I'd ever been. And the agency said, I went in and they said, oh, we won't take your digital photos now because you must have a lot of like inflammation or you do. And what a retention from the flight. And I was like thinking in my head, this is the smallest I have ever been. I don't have water retention. Like I am how am I going to get smaller than this? And and I ended up, I went, did this ridiculous juice cleanse and oh my God. excessively exercised. Completely my relationship with exercise just became, it was punishment. It was yeah. not something that how like how my relationship is now and how it was before it was punishment. And it was, food was all about eating as little as possible. And I remember, as you said, with losing the last five, I remember I had a goal weight 
And I thought when I got to this goal weight, I would be happy. I would feel successful. I'd feel fulfilled, which is wrong in terms of like our weight can never make us feel that way. But I think when you're caught up in it, it that's what you it takes up a hundred, almost a hundred percent of your mental load and space. And so that's what I thought. And I remember I got to this weight and I looked in the mirror and all I could see were things that were wrong with my body. And so all I thought was like, okay, now it's not enough. Now I need to do this and, and lose more weight. And in hindsight, looking back on that, I just feel so sad for my kind of, I think I was about 21 years old at that point mm. self because I was just so caught up in it. And I was just on this roller coaster of this wheel of it just continued. You just stay in this diet, toxic diet culture cycle and it just sucks you in. Yeah. And I came back to Australia and over kind of the next little period, I got a lot closer to Steph because Steph had then my business partner and or my now business partner, but, but friend at the time, and she'd gone through a similar journey. I think when you are in a disordered e eating mindset or, or going through that, you feel very shameful. So you don't tell anyone about it because you are, it's really interesting. I feel like I was aware of how controlled I was being. I didn't want to, to stop, but I knew and I didn't really tell anyone about it. But with Steph, because she'd gone through a similar journey, I felt comfortable opening up to her about it. And through that time, I was able to rebuild that relationship with food, exercise, and then myself. And wow. from there, that was when Steph and I decided to start Kick. We started with an ebook, which was just really basic. The most honestly, when people say, don't wait until your product is perfect to launch it. It was the, when I look back on it now, I just die. <laughs> that we released it into the world. Like it's that we use flash photography. Anyone that shoots food, we use flash photography for food, which you don't, no one does that. You do not do, but we didn't know, right? Yeah. And the reason we wanted to start something was that we felt that a lot, and it's still, it is getting a little bit better now, but a lot of people don't grow up with the privilege of understanding like how to move their body knowing what to do, what they actually enjoy. Like for a lot of us, you grow up, you do school sport, yep. you might have a bad experience in school sport and that then informs your relationship with exercise for the rest of your life. And if you don't live in a household where your parents are talking to you about it and empowering you with that information also around the way that you eat yep. and eating healthy and looking after yourself, looking after your mind, it's really hard to access that information unless you go into the diet kind of sphere of the world where it's all about depriving your body, punishing yourself and losing weight. And so we wanted to create a place in Kick where people could come and be empowered with those tools, but without the toxic diet culture kind of coating that is, it does exist in a lot of the industry. And so at Kick we say we want people to come in because they want to take care of their body, not because they hate it, mm. which is what a lot of the... It's a, such a powerful reframing of it's so important. the wellness space in general because so much of it comes through the lens of punishment yeah. and just like self-contempt. Yeah, exactly. And it is, it's a billion dollar, the diet industry yeah. is a billion dollar industry yeah. and they continue to make money. So obviously they yeah. continue to go. And, and unfortunately that messaging, it does work. Like, and when we first started, so we did the ebook in 2015. We then used the funds from the ebook to then go into a subscription website. That was so. Let's talk about the ebook for a second. So you launched this ebook. How did you guys get customers to buy the ebook? Like, how did that start? Good question. So <laughs> at that stage, Steph had built a. Steph was one of the first people in Australia to build a online community on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So at that stage, she had around five hundred thousand. And this is like twenty fifteen. Yeah, five hundred thousand followers, which in twenty fifteen, that's. Huge. I mean, it's still huge now, but yeah. that was. It was. She yeah. was one of the first. And so Steph had built this online community, and I also had a food blog. It was called Food Fit and Repeat, which is just tragic. But anyway, again, you got to start somewhere. Yep. I remember with the blog, it took me because I'm not a tech which I'm sure we'll go into with Steph and I are both not tech yeah. founders. So interesting. We'll talk about that. Yes. So I don't have a tech background. So I was trying to build this blog out and I remember it took me two days to work out how to put a title on also, the page. Also, this is a different time. Yeah. On the internet. <laughs> so like, true. It was not just like you went on Squarespace and had all these templates and you were no. ready to go and look professional. Like you had to like code. Exactly. And I was on, I think it was WordPress I yeah. used to build it out, but it was so much less advanced yet <laughs> than where it is today. And so I had built, I think I'd built a community. My following was around 50,000 of my food blog and I was getting like quite good traffic to mm -hmm. that website. 
And that was, so what we'd done is we'd built a community through, I had through my food blog, Steph had through her personal brand. And what that meant was then when we launched the product, we already had a community, especially from the food blog perspective, but then also with Steph, like people always asking her to share her recipes because she was sharing what she was eating on her Instagram. Yep that people were then wanting the product. So when we launched it, we sold around over a couple of months, like 10,000 copies, which oh, wow. was just insane, mm. especially considering that the, we look back at it. Some people, it's so funny. Like they say they still have it and they use some of the recipes, which is amazing. But it is not something that we would put out now, I, just in terms of the quality. <laughs> so then in 2016, you launched a subscription website. What were you offering people and why did you make that decision that was going to be like the next step of what you were doing? So the ebook to to start with is why well, I think it's really important to acknowledge we didn't start with a business plan. We yeah. didn't say okay, we're going to build this company. Here's our five. You didn't know plan. you were building a like a top performing fitness app. Absolutely not. No. no, no idea, and didn't even think at that stage an app would be possible for yeah. us to be completely honest. And so we did the ebook, and it exceeded all expectations. And so we had the revenue from the ebook. And with an ebook, the thing is, once you launch it, it's done. There's nothing, there's no kind of, engage, you can engage with the community in terms of them using it, but there's no ongoing engagement. Mm-hmm. And so we thought, okay, this has worked really well. Where do we go from here? And at the time subscription, like obviously Netflix was around, but it is, it was such a different landscape to the industry was so different to where it is today with subscription. It was very, especially within Australia, there weren't that many subscription platforms. We built out or work with a web designer to build out a subscription website. The reason that we didn't make the most sense for us was that we wanted to offer ongoing content and continue to drive revenue for the business. And so that meant that we didn't do a free model. We wanted to do the subscription. And we did, I believe it was three recipes a month and one workout a month, which in terms of value of content, very low. Again, learning you have to start somewhere and that was what we had the resources to do because we didn't have a team at the time it was Steph and I doing it and the work I remember the workouts we would film them with different personal trainers at different gyms and some would be in the back of a gym or so dark and then sometimes (laughs) it was like in the park it was so like an app is so beautiful now zero actually I think just (laughs) so helpful for people to know this though right like this first version can become something like kick and what it is today and I think that's really helpful for people to hear that like it doesn't have to look like kick today on your first day that's not realistic you have to build the momentum oh a hundred percent okay business besties I want to just pause for a second I've got Natalie here on the female founders world team and I want to ask Nat are you ready for the holidays honestly no and I feel like it's coming up so quickly it's coming up so quickly and that's why I wanted to take a second to chat about this season's presenting sponsor, Vistaprint. It's honestly the best place to start holiday shopping. And right now, Vistaprint is giving all female founder world listeners an early holiday gift up to 50% off holiday cards, wall calendars, and more. Oh, wow. 50% is a pretty pretty good deal. How do you even have time though for all this holiday shopping? I know, honestly, like I, I'm usually pretty disorganized, but I've been quite on it this year. And we've also been sending out these really cute thank you packs to different founders who have been on the podcast, speakers who have been at the events. We've printed really cute, like little fleece blankets. We have embroidered caps and also stuff for my family as well. Cause you know, everyone's going to be wearing the female founder world merch. Oh, of course you got to bring the family into it. And I, I personally love a branded tote bag, but I also didn't know that they did embroidery. That's yes, pretty cool. The embroidered caps are particularly cute. Oh, I love that. Highly recommend. So everyone go and get your holiday shopping buttoned up with up to 50% off custom holiday cards, wall calendars, and more at vistaprint.com. Use the code HOLIDAY50 at checkout. Okay, let's get back into the show. Okay, so 2017, you launched a grocery business as well. This is like very quick. Like two years in, all of a sudden, you've launched this like CPG product. You launched into Coles, which is the biggest retailer in the country in Australia. Why did you launch that? What was it? What are your learnings from that? CPG is hard. It is. It is hard. And we had two business partners that were experienced Mm -hmm. in the industry and that's how we were able to go into it. I think that's been a big lesson along the journey for Steph and I that we have done really well is always brought in people that have the experience in the areas Mm. that we don't to fill those gaps. So what had happened there and how that started the grocery business was we actually caught up for someone reached out and said, hey, 
I want you to work with us and be the ambassador of this gluten-free bread company that we're launching into Australia. So we, I took the meeting. I, in my head, I was like, I don't, I'm not gluten-free. I also, I just don't think I'm going to be the ambassador of this, but let's take the meeting and yeah. see. Because I think that's been a huge lesson. You never, ever know where a meeting can take you. And so we took the meeting and by the end of that meeting, we'd worked out, we're not going to go down this gluten-free bread route, but there was something there and there was the opportunity for us to build out our own Mm -hmm. product range. I had in, would have been in a 20, at the end of 2014, I had launched a protein powder business and with my personal trainer at the time, I ended up exiting that business after a year because we weren't aligned on where the business was going. Again, that was a huge lesson. It is so important that you're aligned if you have a co-founder on where you're going, values, et cetera. So I already had experience within, in Australia, we call it FMCG, so mm-hmm. it's similar in that industry. And I was really passionate about it. I just loved going to supermarkets and being like, where are the opportunities? Where can we add value here? And so in meeting our two business partners, Tom and Jim, at, well, I didn't know they were going to be our business partners, but having this coffee, it presented this opportunity of hang on up. We don't want to be the ambassador for this brand. We want it to be our brand and we will drive it with you and we will build it. I think that was something that at this stage, we'd both, Steph and I had been on social media for Instagram for a few years and we had seen the impact that we could make on other brands in selling and and driving revenue for them. And so for us, it was thinking about how do we build a sustainable business here for ourselves that doesn't rely on us personally and kind of ambassador roles and things like how do we actually build out a company and use it that we've got this amazing community that we've built with with there there's a problem like at that time especially within uh, Australia or the only place you could get like chia seeds and now it's crazy to say that because in Australia you can buy chia seeds at any supermarket but back in 2017 you could only get it at a health store Mm. there wasn't as many health food products available in the supermarket and so we wanted to bring health food products of like into the supermarket at accessible prices for people. So they didn't have just to make it easier because we just wanted to make healthy eating more accessible. And, and that's always been our kind of mission with the grocery business. And so that was 2017. We launched with seven SKUs into Coles. A SKU is, I didn't know what a SKU was before I started. For anyone that doesn't know, it just means like a product. So we did kombucha, kimchi and protein. They weren't protein balls. They were bliss balls. So dates, like really whole food It's a lot to balls. launch with. Yes. And the reason for that was with the way Coles and Woolworths often work is they have areas that open up of opportunities within categories. And so we wanted to solve the problems for what that category buyer needed. And we were actually, I think we were, if not the first, one of the first to launch into Coles and Woolworths with our marketing strategy being completely in channels, social media based. Before that, a lot of the, obviously there's all the key players like Kellogg's and and all of those brands within the supermarkets, but social media was just coming up. For us, we've been on it for a long time, but for big corporate, they hadn't, I don't think, embraced it as much as they they have now. And so our buyer, his name was Sam, he took a huge risk on our company because we hadn't done it before and also we were using social media as a marketing channel, which they hadn't, you know, we hadn't really proved that you could drive sales of into Coles and Woolworths or in FMCG, FMCG, um, before that. And I remember the first time we went on the first few weeks of sales and kind of 12 weeks, that's how they work in terms of looking at, okay, what's the success within 12 weeks? So then look at, will you get more ranging? It's the product going to have to be deleted, et cetera. And we could show that when we posted on social media, we would drive the same sales uplift as a 10% promotion. Wow. And so that for us was the kind of data that we needed to then enable us to grow out our, our SKUs. And also go into Woolworths, which for any American listeners or people, I know you have listeners all around the world, Woolworths is the other really big supermarket within Australia. And so we ended up with around 85 SKUs, which we built over four years. Then in 2021, our the company was acquired by a group called Openway, who were backed by a really big private equity firm in Australia which was really exciting to be able to drive the business to acquisition. It also meant that we were doing, so in the period that we ran the business, we were contract manufacturing. So what that means is that we didn't own any manufacturing facilities. We were paying manufacturers to manufacture the products and then selling to Coles and Woolworths 
we were doing all the product development and everything, but what that meant is there's a margin that gets cut into within that process. So obviously the manufacturers, they have to make profit on what they're selling back to us. And it meant that we couldn't be as competitive with discounts within Coles and Woolworths just because we didn't have the same margins as all of the other businesses that had their own manufacturing facility. So Openway enabled us to have our own manufacturing facility, which is really exciting. And it was, yeah, it was a really big learning journey and really enjoyed it. So it was a really good, um, incredible learning experience for us. And yeah, to drive it to acquisition was really exciting. Wow. That is such an incredible story to hear the beginning to exit, but then you've actually got this like content business that at the same time is gearing up as well. When did the app become a thing? When did this happen? So the app, it was also in 2017. So the, or 2017 into 2018. So we had the subscription platform because it is, it's interesting. Right, you guys must have been busy. Both Are businesses. You okay? <laughs> I mean, all the founders listening, they know you just keep going. Yeah, follow the momentum. You just, exactly. You have to. So in 20, back in, so the, the way the business has gone, just for everyone listening, because I know it can sound a little bit complex in the timeline, the FMCG business was completely separate. So the, yep. we had our four founders and then with the kick, uh, at the time it was actually called Keep It Cleaner, but with that business, which is now the app, the socials, yep. everything that we have, the kind of media, the podcast, that's always been just Steph and I and has followed a similar trajectory, like really exciting, but it's been a totally separate business. So if we go back to the kind of app content business, so we had this subscription platform in 2016. Mm -hmm. We were then approached by a company in 20, at the end of 2016 to build out our own program with them. So what that meant for us, we were still doing three recipes, one workout a month, and we knew that we were not providing the offering to our community that we wanted to. And we we didn't know where to start really, to be completely honest, and, and also did not have the resources nor the funds to be able to build out a platform at that point. And so they approached us and we went into a partnership agreement with them. We worked with them for a year. We built out a platform together they had a team of 50 which was oh, wow. incredible they were the company that also launched center so they had a lot of at the time they didn't have chris hemsworth's app center but they had quite a few other apps and essentially they were a white label company they inserted the talent or the brand and then that would go to market so we worked with them for a year had so many learnings it was a really great experience and from there we decided to go out on our own to then launch the app in 20. 18. So for people who have an idea for an app, they want to build something like this, what lessons do you have around white labeling a product versus just going all in and building it yourself? I think it depends on the resources that, that you have. And I was actually speaking to one of your incredible community members at the summit about this, because I think around apps. So when we went out to build the app, when we decided we were going to end the partnership with this white label company, they also, we had a web app with them. So essentially it was a website that you could then download an icon on the phone as an app, but it wasn't an app. And for us being as accessible and making it as easy as possible for people to live a healthy lifestyle was so important. And we felt that we could not do that through the web app. And we wanted to have and needed the app to be able to really grow the business to where we thought that we could. However, when we went into that agreement, we did not have the funds to build out an app nor a web app to be completely transparent. Mm. And so for us, that made sense at the time of the journey. And then when we went to build out the app, so within our partnership agreement, we had a night, it was a 90 day period where we had before we, and we knew that after the 90 days, we had to launch the product to market because the web app was being wound down. And if we did not launch a product and market within a kind of at that 91 day mark, the community would go. Yeah. Maybe not go. We, I love our community so much and they're so loyal and, I and fantastic. I think they just waited a few more days. They maybe waited a few I more think, days. I think you would be really okay. but, but it's a competitive market. Yeah. If we can't solve what they're looking for, then of course they're going to have to go and find something mm -hmm. else. So we knew that was so important. And we went out and we were like, okay, we need to build this app. How much is it going to cost? And we got quoted a million dollars wow. to build an app. We we're like, okay, we do not have a million dollars. Yeah. And the other option as well outside of that, and this is what I spoke to the wonderful community member at, at the summit about, was that 
something that I feel like a lot of people get when you're not tech founder founders and you don't understand, you don't know how to code and you can't do it yourself or you can't check in, jump in and be like, okay, looking at this quote, because if someone quotes me for or that stage for an app, I don't know if what they're telling me is, is right because I've never done it before. And so my advice to her was to get an advisor that understands tech. We did not do that. I wish that we did because they will have your back and you will be able to go to them to fill that gap that you need to fill because otherwise you can go into really scary territory. The other thing as well is the cost of building an app is one thing, but maintaining an app is another thing. And a lot of people get, I know so many founders that spend their entire savings or mortgage their houses to build an app out and then they don't account for the cost of maintenance. So if iOS or, or Google or whatever it is change something within their product, you then have to change your app to make sure that works. If you don't change it, your app isn't going to work. Things will break, especially if you're using, depending on the code that you're using, you have to make sure you're continually updating mm. it. Also, it's incredibly important to actually build new features. And when you first go to market, your MVP product is not going to be the product that like now when we look back at the app we launched in, we ended up launching in 2018. It is so different to the product that we have today because we didn't have the feedback. We didn't know you, you need to allow for to have funds to be able to continue to go with your app. That's something that I feel like not a I not enough people talk about and I think especially for a lot of women that build we are so good at building community for some I know women in tech is growing so much which is amazing but for a lot of us that don't have that tech background it's so important to to be aware of and what we ended up doing was going into an agreement with a app and gaming company which was revenue share and so that worked for us because we didn't have the hundreds of thousands to a million dollars to build the app out front. And what it meant was that we could get it to market at speed because mm. we only had that 90 day period to be able to work out, to be able to get it to market. And so that was in 2018. And then in 2021, so three years on, we then brought our tech in house. We now have our tech team, our own tech team, which was really important kind of inflection point for the business. But could we have built out an app in 2018? I don't think so. And so that for us made the most sense at the time. And I think if we had have thought, no, we don't want to go into a, a partnership agreement or a revenue share agreement, we want to, the only way to do it is building our app and paying for it ourselves and doing it and not giving away any revenue. I think it would have really, really limited our growth to where we could get to. I have so many questions for you. I actually don't even know where to start. This is so interesting to me. So you've talked about all of this growth, all of these things that you've been doing, how are you guys funding all of this? It started with the ebook. So, so it's the, literally, you've it's just been funded itself. Efforts. Exactly right. This is incredible. So you don't have any external investors? No, we don't. Wow. Talk to me about that. Because people would want to invest in you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. It's been a journey. So we are bootstrapped. Mm -hmm. And Last year was the first year. So in 2023, that was the first year we thought about getting investment. For us to grow, a big part of our growth strategy currently is going into different markets. It costs so much money to enter new markets. Yeah. There's also a really high risk associated with it because you do not know how that market is going to receive you your product. You've launched the UK now. We have. Are you, do you have a big presence in the US? In the US we do as well. Yeah. So the two markets we were looking at are the US and the UK. Yeah. So in terms of our, we're in 121 countries with the oh. app. The biggest markets are outside of Australia, US, UK, New Zealand, and then I think it's Canada. Canada and Germany kind of yeah. goes between the two. And so we looked at the opportunities. Obviously, uh, the app is not obviously, but the app is in, is in English. We will look as a part of our product roadmap down the track. Being able to have it in multiple languages is yeah. super important to us. And we want to get there, but we're just not ready to yeah. be able to go there now. And so the UK and the US made the most sense. When evaluating both markets, I think from an Australian perspective, there's a lot of kind of horror stories of Australian businesses launching into the US. It's obviously such a huge market. As everyone says, it's not one market. It's 55 yes. different countries. Yeah. It's You cannot look at it like you're just launching into one market. Mm -hmm. We do have a bigger organic community in the US, but with the UK for us, it when we did all, the, all of the market research, when people think of health they in the UK, a lot of them think of Australia. So we didn't have to change the product much to be able to go into the UK. 
The other thing with the US market is that, and I think it is changing, but our messaging in it's about how you feel. It's not about how you look. We do not use any, like if you go within our app, there's no calories on. We have a dietitian that checks all the recipes, yeah. the meal plans. They're all done in a way that, of course, it's the right amount of calories you're meant to have in the day. Yeah. But calories, seeing calories on meals can be really triggering totally. for a lot of people that have had disordered eating or just generally struggled with body image. And so we don't have any calories within the app that's visible because of that. We also don't have any area to do your before or your after weight. Mm. We, we do not do like measurements of your body. We do not do that. And the US market, that is quite a big focus with a lot of the really successful products over here. And so for us looking at that, it was like, okay, can we, with a very small budget without funding, penetrate this market? Because it is harder to market you're going to feel better than you are going to lose five kilos. Yeah. That is a very, five kilos is a very tangible outcome for people. You're going to feel amazing. Like you're going to change the way your relationship that you have with yourself and wellness, all of the, like our kick mission and what we do, it is harder to get across when you're competing with that kind of weight loss messaging in a market like the US where we don't have as much awareness, obviously, as we have in Australia, et cetera. And so that's why we chose the UK so at that point, that was when we thought, okay, do we go out and get funding? Mm. We did go out. We spoke to quite a few investors in Australia. The Australian investor mark or investment market is very different to the UK and the US. It is, oh, I would say over 90% is B2B. So not direct to consumer. We just don't have the population in Australia for there to be really big direct to consumers in the market, which I totally understand. And so for us, it was very important. We were not just looking for money. We were looking for a strategic partner to help us launch into different markets and also help us with Kick what we've been able to to build and grow with the community and all of the kind of we've had hundreds of thousands of people through the program we've spoken to so many different women about what they like we know 18 to 35 year old women so well and so what we're looking at as well as a business is what are the adjacencies outside of the app where we can explore for kick mm -hmm. and add value to people's lives and support them and so for us it was looking for a strategic partner that could help with that or help with the global expansion and we could not find that partner in Australia and so we decided okay, we're not going to go and sign on with someone who doesn't have experience in direct-to-consumer, probably doesn't understand our business yep. as well as we would like them to and also doesn't feel like they're going to be the right partner. And I think as well with Kick and Australia, like especially within VCs, like there's been some incredible success stories out of Australia. Canva. Canva, Linktree, like mm -hmm. amazing. And they've had this incredible hockey stick growth. Kick has been a very sustainable growing business. Like we've grown year on year since launch, which is really exciting, but we have not had 30 times growth one year and then 40 times the next year. We've had really sustainable, healthy growth. And that also to then go in, have investment from a VC, what that would mean is obviously the expectation on growth yep. goes to, and, and it has changed like back early last, oh, I would say it's changed maybe mid last year in Australia, but it was grow at all costs mentality. Yeah. And I don't run, I'm not the right CEO to run a business that's grow at all costs mentality. Cause we had within a lot of tech companies, a huge one third of the companies were being made redundant. Like the staff changes, they were also hiring 100 people a week. Yeah. I can't, we have been so considered with every step that we've made that just didn't feel right. For us. I want to ask you about community now because I think this is a perfect segue because you're growing, you're saying like growing sustainably and I think a big piece of that is this work that you're doing around building the community around Kick. You have a podcast that alone is like an amazing business but is within your ecosystem. I think you're getting 150,000 downloads a month or something. We, we, yeah, we have 150,000 unique. Amazing. Yeah, that is so amazing. amazing. We do not get that many downloads. I would love to have that many downloads. That's incredible. Talk me through like your lessons around community building because it seems like something that comes so naturally to you and to Steph as well, watching from afar. As someone like I'm trying to build a community-led business too and I see what you're doing and I'm just like in awe. You're so good at it. What are the lessons? Give me advice. Give me free business <laughs> advice. What advice do you have for someone like me or anyone who's trying to build community around their business? First of all, thank you. That's really kind. And also you will get to that 100%. <laughs> Your product is so strong. 
In terms of building community, I think it's very, and it has, I have to say, and I think this is really important to acknowledge, building a community in 2015, I would say is easier, was easier. And I know this is really unhelpful for everyone that's like, Laura, I'm starting to build my community now. And it's not helpful to know that it was easier back in 2015, but especially through Instagram. And then we saw on TikTok, maybe, or 2020, it was not again, it's never, ever, ever easy to grow a platform and I don't want to take away from anyone that has. But at that point, it was easier to build a build your audience on TikTok, for example, yep. than it is now. Yeah. So I think that's really important to acknowledge. With community, I think as well it's really important to – obviously we want to grab communities as big as possible. We can get the most reach. But what is really important I think now and in the communities that are growing and cutting through and it's like what you're doing so, so is you are very clear on the problem you are solving for your community and the type of people yeah. that are going to connect with your community. And if you went broader than that, you would lose that magic and you probably wouldn't be able to sell 700 tickets or 600 or whatever it was, which is amazing to the summit. And so I think sometimes when we look at it as founders, it can be, especially like a lot of founders are very high performing, very critical on ourselves because we want to just be like better and better. And I think we can put so much pressure on ourselves that we need to, bigger is always better. But I think with building community in 2024, I think being actually more niche is a better strategy, but you have to be very clear on what you're going to solve for your audience. And so, I totally agree with that, particularly yeah. if you're bootstrapping. Exactly, you're exactly. And so for us, the way that community, so as I said, before we'd launch our product, we had built a community that were health and wellness, like especially within my blog, Steph's audience was a little bit more broad, but mm -hmm. there was still a lot in there that were very interested in health and wellness. We had that. And then my blog was health and wellness recipe specific. So we yeah. had built a community that was wanting recipe content. Now, the way that we look at it, for us is, and it's also been because I don't, and Steph and I both don't have a background in paid media. And a lot of founders that have built really successful health and wellness apps are very paid media focused. For us, community building and, and connecting with people was our strength. And so that's why we have built out the own channels that we have. I would say one of the biggest pieces of magic and why we've been able to do it is because of the connection we've been able to build with the audience and it's about how you make them feel if you make people feel not alone feel a part of something and feel something generally like we there's that saying that they won't remember what you said but they'll remember how you made them feel and mm -hmm. I think that is so true with building community and so for us with kick with our mission being what it is and more broader wanting basically wanting people to not feel alone in navigating as between 18 to 35 as a woman and non-binary person we are on have purposely been incredibly open and real and vulnerable and I know that not every it doesn't make sense for every business to do this but for us it made a lot of sense to open up about what we were going through, if it's in building the business, but also in for us, because kick started because of a struggle that with body image and disordered eating that we both went through, that you can feel so, so alone in navigating. When you know that you're not alone and someone else sees you, that is the power in that is just, it's hard to put into words. And that's how the community has been able to grow. I totally agree with you. Something that like I struggle to navigate I hear from other people in the community struggling to navigate. It's this tension of showing up in a way that feels true to you and it you are being vulnerable enough that you're letting your guard down so that other people can connect with you as the person who is like living and sharing the mission of your business. But at the same time, you want to project the strength. Like everything's fine here. The business is doing great. Like you're also the person that has to put that face forward. And so I feel like there's this real tension. Like I, I think about this all the time about like what am I willing to share here to connect with people? And because I also just, that's just who I am. I want to connect versus is this like the best thing for the brand and the business? I don't know. How do you navigate that tension between like vulnerability and then being, you've got a team, like you've got these people that are looking to you as a leader. Like what's that tension there and how do you feel about that? Oh, it's such a good point. And it is, it can be difficult at times. I think with Kick specifically and with because because it's so closely tied to Steph and my personal brand, which mm. is broader than Kick, you don't need to share everything. And I think that's really important. I, I would hate anyone listening to think like, okay, and I have to share every struggle I've ever been through yeah. in my life that's really personal to me in order to grow. Absolutely not. Yeah. I think it's focusing on your 
business, like the pro- the problem you are solving, why are you solving that for the community? Now, if it's just for money, it's very unlikely you have a successful business anyway, because it's very hard to connect with people if you say, oh, I just wanted to build a business and make a shitload of money. <laughs> They're like, cool, I, I'm not going to be part of this community. Like you're a lone ranger there. But I think if you say I solve, as your mission is with your business, I am solving this. And for us, I'm, we're solving this problem for people because of that journey that we went through. That's where, so if it's a skincare company because you couldn't find another solution in the market, of course, because you're not just going to make a product that copies another product, mm-hmm. right? It's You're always solving. And that's the most successful businesses have solved a very clear product, a problem for people. And so it's why did you need to solve that problem? And often there, there is a vulnerable story that people will, will connect with. And I think that's really important to acknowledge. In terms of being a leader and sharing the difficulties, and especially with your business, because you are helping like female and non-binary entrepreneurs navigate And it's really important to acknowledge that it's actually really fucking hard. And I think someone once said to me, it's like a business, running a business, there's a a four-year cycle and you have three really shit years and one good year. But the one good Mm. year gets you through the cycle. And Mm. I was like, oh, no way. I'm not doing three shit years in exchange for one. That's crazy. But the more I think about it, it's actually, and it might not be in that order. Yeah. But if you think of the percentage of the hard times versus the good, there's more hard times than there are good times. And so I think it is important what I, the way I do it, that I felt I feel comfortable, I never share in the moment. Mm. Because sharing in the moment, I feel like you're still navigating it. And then I don't want to put that burden on my team that they have to help me navigate things that they don't, my job for my team is to support them. Yeah. There was there's, there's a really good quote that vulnerability is not oversharing, mm. especially to your team. And you want to be, you want to show them that you're a human because I think that makes you a really good leader and that's a big part of my leadership style. But I never want them to feel like they have to solve my problems. That yeah. is my job. Yeah. And if they don't need to know about it, I will not share it with them. I My first job in media was at Mamma Mia back in the day. Was like, it? And they were very, a lot smaller than they are now before they were podcasting. And something that Mia says and that I listen to all her podcasts now and I still consider her a mentor even though I don't speak to her anymore but she says like you should share from a scar not a wound yes and I just think that it, I think about that a lot yeah. yeah exactly exactly and so what we do for example I had a couple of months ago I had a, like the worst panic attack I've ever had in mm. my life oh, and sorry thank you thank it's you it's the worst feeling it, it is it, it really is isn't it yeah. And I purposely that we, it's actually the first time in my life I've not, I've cancelled a shoot mm. and not showed up at work yeah. the, the, the day after, cause it was a really long one. And I, in that moment, I did not say, hi team, I've had a panic attack. Yeah. I'm not going to, and, and I don't know, I think for that is, and I think if someone else in the team was sharing that, I think that's very different. But as the leader of the company, I yeah. think it is, I just didn't want to put that burden on the team. I didn't share, I said I was really sick and then. A few weeks later, we spoke about it on the podcast and I then said to the team, like, hey, I went through this. I'm completely fine now. And yeah. then the reason I'm sharing it is to help people that are going through it, help them feel not alone, but not at a time where my team then needs to think they have to tippy-toe around me yeah. because I've, I just don't want to put that burden on them. So, yeah, it's really good advice. And also I think, like, then you're – if you're feeling raw about something and you're putting it out into the world and then you're really – it's really, like, porous. Like, you're then taking on everyone else's responses and the way that they feel about that. Like, when I had my son, I remember – I didn't tell anyone that I worked with, really, that I was pregnant or that I'd had a baby because I was like, they're going to think that I'm going to be tapped out, that I'm not – and it's, like, all of their expectations yeah. on it. And it wasn't until – like much later that on calls I was like oh yeah I've I've got a baby now like I've got a child what did people say because you didn't tell them they're like oh okay like when (laughs) he must be a really good baby like really easy whatever I'm like yeah I just don't want your expectations to come into this conversation while I'm still feeling vulnerable about it and sorting it out for myself so I think that's a big thing as well Something else that you're really great at is content. And I want to understand your process for content creation, what that looks like within your team, because you're the CEO of a tech company, but you're also this amazing like creator as well. How do you allocate your time and how do you think about that? It is the one of the hardest things I yeah. think I'm getting. And I think for female founders, especially within beauty, and I think health and wellness and beauty are the key categories where the expectation is that you're also the face of the company. Mm. 
and content. Zoe Foster Blake, have you read her new book? I haven't, but I really want to. So Zoe is the founder of Go To Skincare for anyone that, that doesn't know, and she's just written a book, and it's fiction, which is fantastic mm. because it's so honest. Because it's fiction, I've never read a fiction business book. It's mm. called Things Will Calm Down Soon. Yes. Which how many times yeah. do we say that? Yeah, yeah. Things will calm down soon. And it's such a good. As I was reading it, I just felt so validated around the struggles of being the face of your company and also running the company mm. mainly because we, when it comes to content you can never do enough especially because now there's multiple platforms like for us we do podcasts instagram and tiktok it's a treadmill it is a treadmill and you cannot it's really tough you actually can't get off it because it is really important for, especially for kick in us in growing our audience and then bringing people into the the platform and so the way I try and go about it, I've never been, because a lot of my content is from the way that I'm feeling or things that I've navigated and it's very real, I don't have a content plan in terms of, from a kick perspective, we do have one, but from a personal perspective, I don't. I feel I find that just doesn't work for me. At Kick, the way that our team is structured within social media is we have one person who looks after uh, TikTok. Mm -hmm. Also, sometimes videos go across both platforms, but we do have a different strategy for each platform. And then one person that looks after Instagram, they run the Kick platform. So Steph and I don't run those platforms. We are in the content often, which is filmed in during, the, it's quite jarring sometimes to go from like a meeting with our CFO into filming a dance yeah <laughs> but it's, it's and learning it I'm like oh my goodness but it's just that that's, that's we're part in. of it, it's about 24, guys. exactly yeah. exactly <laughs> and so that that's how the kick platforms run and with kick we've always been it's really important through our socials a big part of our strategy is to show our brand personality a lot of the health and wellness space is very serious as it should be yeah but for us, we don't take things, we know when to take things seriously and also when to have fun. And that's really important. And it's actually why a lot of people stay like in the workouts on the kick app. We are always like, we're joking with the trainers. If Steph, We're not in every video, but when we're in the videos, we're not there as the person telling them, you need to start doing mm -hmm. squats. We're there being like, oh my God, this is so hard. Yes. Telling the trainer to stop like talking to us, like all of those things. And mm -hmm. people like it because they connect with it because they feel like they're working out with a friend. It doesn't feel like we're telling them what to do. And so that fun element of our personality as a brand is very important. And so that's a big part of our social media strategy and then personally I just I've just had to get come to a point I'm still navigating this that sometimes it's okay to not pump out like some weeks I can't pump out as much content as I usually can it's something though that I'm really struggling to come to terms with because I've yeah, it's hard not to just want to continue doing more and feel like you're not letting one side of the business down I totally understand mm. that Okay, so you're someone who started in 2015 with an ebook and now you've got this like how big's your team now 20. You've got a 20-person team. You've got this really successful app. You have an amazing podcast. How does someone bridge the gap in their knowledge of business, entrepreneurship, life? Like I often feel like businesses can't level up to a point beyond the leaders there. And I'm really curious about what some of those growth barriers were that you were hitting and the business was hitting and how you overcome the, overcame those throughout the last few years. Oh, it's so true. And I always say that I will only be the CEO of Kick for as long as it's serving the company. Like I am very self-aware that there is going to be a point, especially yeah. as we grow into different markets and with product adjacencies, I'm not always going to be the best person to lead this company. Yeah. But right now I am. And But what's very important with that is that I have leveled up with the company. I think not being so Steph and I both, as we've discussed, don't have tech backgrounds. That definitely was limiting for the business in our growth, I would say for sure. But it's something that through time we've been able to plug those holes and getting really good people into the business that we trust are really great at their jobs and, and can fill those gaps has been essential in our growth journey. I think as well for a very long time, I would, cause I've always, I'd it's really interesting with imposter syndrome. I know a lot of people say they don't like acknowledging it, that it's a thing because then it's giving it airtime. We shouldn't. But for me, I do feel like imposter syndrome has been a big part yeah. of my journey, especially being, I think as well, when you're a founder and you are the CEO of your company, I think I made myself the CEO. Steph and I, like oh obviously God. with our advisor. So is it really real? At Summit, my, I've got this leadership coach. She's amazing, Barbara. And I I always introduced myself as like the creator of Female Founder World. And she was like, can you please introduce yourself as the founder and the CEO? This is your moment. You're on a stage in front of people that have paid a ticket price to come and see this thing. Like, can you call yourself? And I was like, 
Yeah, but it's like my thing. I don't know. Am I the CEO? Yes. Yes. I, what is this? Like mental block around it. It's crazy. And I would say any, if we were men, we would not feel that way. No, feel of so course not. So comfortable putting that label yes. on ourselves. Yeah. So I think because of that, I it's so true. And I feel like so many women feel the same way. And so because of that, I'm like, am I even, I, do I, am I deserving of this? Am I good enough to do this? All of those things. And I'd look at other leaders and they've got 40 more years experience or 20 or whatever, more than me. They've also got an MBA. They've worked at multiple companies. I've only, because since I finished, so I ended up finishing my law and business degree, but it was while I was running Kick. So I haven't had another job outside of Subway yeah. waitressing and working in administration at a hospital. So I think that's always been something that I'm like, okay, ha and I, I've expected myself, I was comparing myself to these leaders and thinking like, why am I not there? And trying to level up through podcast books, et cetera. But then I spoke to someone and it was such a pivotal moment for me. And they said, they were talking about, it's the founder of Linktree, Alex, and he's incredible. And we actually knew each other like 10 years ago and we've reconnected and he's been an amazing mentor. And he was telling me about, his, and Linktree has a billion dollar valuation. It's a huge company. And he's the CEO. And he was talking to me about how he has multiple coaches. And I was like, mm. you need a coach? But you're, you've built this billion dollar business. What do you mean you need a coach? He's yeah. Laura, everyone has all, tell me leaders that you look up to. And I was listing all these CEOs. And he was like, yeah, I know their coach. I know their coach. I know their coach. And I was like, hang on. People don't just work it out themselves. And I think I had this feeling of I can't get a coach because that's me admitting that I'm not good enough mm. and then I'll be found out. And that was a very big moment for me in being like, hang on, no, I can ask for help. It is okay to not have all the answers. It is okay to get a coach. And having a leadership coach, I have a woman named Janie Martino. She is absolutely incredible. She's the founder of Kintsugi Way. And she has changed the way I lead the business. I have grown so much in the past. I've been working with her for over a year now and my growth as a leader in that period. And it also beyond that, before that, we've had some incredible advisors as well that have helped me really level up and at way faster than yeah. if I tried to do it myself, like times 10. I agree. Like I've, I saw my coach today in person for four hours and just had these like breakthroughs with things that I just wouldn't be able to do on my own. And that's okay. Yeah. No one can. Yeah. And I think that's what's so important is that we think that we're like, oh, I'm not good enough because I need that. But everybody has help. And yeah. the most successful leaders that I have met have the most help because they know that they don't know everything and they know how to get support. Oof, that's so good. Okay. The last thing I want to ask you is if there are any more resources that you can recommend to folks who are listening to this and they're like, Laura is amazing. Kick is amazing. How do I do what she's done? books, podcasts, resources, anything else. Thank you. That's very kind. So I've got two books. One is Good to Great by Jim Collins. Have you read it? No. It's got a red cover. It's really good. I think it's important to acknowledge if you're building a business, like building a business that actually, the, I can't remember the percentage. I think only about 10% of businesses that launch last longer than five years. It's tough to cut through, right? Yep. This book is very good. I believe that you can't if you want to do exceptional things, like if you want to have a business that sustains longer than five years, like only 10% of people do that. You have to do exceptional work. You can't just do average work. You can't expect to put in 80% and get out 110, right? So I really loved Good to Great. It really speaks about how to up level that mindset and why it's important. And then the other book, which is very relevant, I think, to the place I'm at now with the business because when, and, and I'm sure there's so many founders listening, when you start, I didn't start thinking I want to be a manager. I want to, you know, I'm going to manage people. And that's what, as now the CEO of the business, a lot of my work is not in, it's not where I started. Like when we started, I was developing recipes and writing yeah, recipes and that type of thing and the blog and all of those things. I wasn't running a company. And so your role changes significantly and, and you have to level up as a manager and, and as, uh, most importantly, as a leader. And so that's something that's I'm navigating right now and just trying to get better and better because the better I can be as a leader, the, the more mm -hmm. that I'm going to be able to help the team. And there's a book called Radical Candor by Kim Scott. So one of our team members, um, Emily, our GM of operations, actually spoke about the book in her interview process. And I was like, this sounds great. I'm going to go read it. And it's fantastic. It, as someone, I really struggle giving or have really struggled. I'm going to yes. reword that because I'm better now at yes. giving feedback. It's yeah. really difficult. It is a skill that you need to learn. I think, think again, you're being kind by not saying the exactly. thing. Exactly. 
Exactly. Yeah. And that's the thing as well. I think a, a lot of female founders I speak to, it's really interesting, especially businesses that are purpose-led like Kick is. Yeah. They expect the expectation on the founder of yes. that business is so different to the expectation that people This is a whole other podcast that oh, we could talk about. It is. There's so much there. I think we they expect no feedback because they think, oh, feedback's mean. No. Feedback is kind. Kindness yeah. actually is feedback. Yeah. Feedback is not mean. It is so important to help the growth of your team. If you don't share something and there's an amazing example at the start of that book – which I always think about where someone wasn't giving the given the feedback and they ended up getting let go. And they said to their manager, why didn't you tell me? Mm. Because if that person doesn't have the feedback, how are they going to improve? Mm. And then you're not giving them the opportunity to lean in. If they don't want to, that's on them. That's their choice. It might not be aligned. But you have to give them that opportunity. And Again, feedback, giving feedback, managing people, leading people, it's not something like I think it needs there needs to be a bit of innate leadership within you. I think that's really important, especially like building leadership presence and that also can be learned, but there has to be some innate in there. But in terms of like actual skills, like tangible skills, like giving feedback, it's n- if you have not learned it, you cannot expect yourself to be great at it. Yeah. You have to do the work. And this book really helped me realise that. Amazing. Laura, thank you so much for coming on the Female Found World podcast and congratulations on everything you have built and on running the marathon <laughs> yesterday and then making it to the studio today. Thank you so much. I have to say too, I feel like, I don't know if it's an excuse to say marathon brain, but I actually feel like <laughs> I have marathon brain today. So I apologise. And No, you're amazing. It's been so good to chat. Thank you so much. I just wanted to jump in and end the show with a quick thank you and shout out to all of our paid Business Bestie subscribers. For $9 a month, Business Besties bypass literally years of networking by getting access to all of the people that you need to build your dream business. Besties get access to exclusive in-person meetups in cities all across the US, Australia, and the UK. You get access to our group chat and you get to bypass the wait list. You also get invited to exclusive monthly group business coaching call sessions where you can speak to experts and founders and ask them all of those questions that you just can't Google. It's $9 a month. You can cancel anytime. Head to bestie.femalefounderworld.com or click the link in the show notes for more.